Okay, okay, don't leave yet. I know. It looks like a slide projector. Your eyelids are already drooping. But trust me, this is considerably more exciting. You might even want one. Who knows? Uh, you see, once in a while I come across something entirely by accident that I've never seen before. And often I have to grab it just because it seems incredibly overbuilt or overdesigned for what it does. And this was one such device. I saw it on eBay while I was looking for something completely different and I just reflexively bought it. I had to know what it was. I think I paid $35 and when it arrived, I was astonished to learn that it was nothing more than it appeared to be, which doesn't seem very exciting since it appears to be, well, a slide projector. And I don't know anybody who cares about those. Everybody I know just wants to scan their slides, and that's an admirable goal to be sure. Uh, one of my friends, the guy who owns the enormous Heidelberg drum scanner that I mentioned a couple videos back, uh, recently bought a whole box of slides from a retired photographer and scanned them on his obnoxiously overpowered Creo flatbed. They all turned out to be magnificent photos dating back to at least the 70s, uh, including some from a part of Mount St. Helens that we're pretty sure doesn't exist anymore. Uh, there's several other notable locations and a few featuring Ansel Adams. So it's all pretty cool stuff, but I, I don't think I've ever met anybody who cared about projecting slides instead of just scanning them. I mean, I'm sure they're out there, but I've never met anyone like that. So I don't think I'd be able to talk anyone into caring about a projector. But what makes this thing interesting is that it's sort of an in-between option. It's not a projector or a scanner or a digitizer, but it is for converting your slides into an electronic form, as you can see from the back panel. You getting the picture yet? <laughs> Let's plug it in. We're just gonna hook up your basic composite video input here runs off your good old North American 110 volts. And I've already got a bunch of slides loaded, so we just hit the button. And there's a slide. Uh, I've got a few more here. I can't for the life of me remember where they came from. I think maybe a viewer sent these to me, but uh, there's a whole collection of photos here ranging from um, what seem to be just like some decent landscape shots. Um, there's some pictures in here from, I, I think somebody's vacation, uh, several different places in the world. Oh, and then there's a whole box of shots that seem to be from a volcano. Uh, and I'm pretty sure these must have been from a researcher, some kind of professional, because, um, well, I, I don't think you can get this sort of photo on uh, on vacation. It really uh, runs the gamut. Uh, and we can see all of these in brilliant analog NTSC because that's what this thing is. It's a slide to video converter. Um, specifically, it's the uh, Elmo TRV-34H, let's just get that off of there. This seems to be a, a late entry in a series of similar devices from Elmo, a Japanese company that made uh, movie cameras and projectors in the mid 20th century. And I don't know how big a name they ever were in those fields. Maybe they were huge, I don't know. But in any case, apparently in the mid eighties, they found out about CCD technology and just made a hard pivot into making document cameras. Uh, those are basically an electronic version of an overhead projector. It's a fixed camera that points down at a surface so you can just lay down a document and instantly see it on a TV screen or whatever. Uh, these eventually became very popular in schools, which led to Elmo departing the consumer sphere to concentrate entirely on education, uh, which is still where they are nowadays. But I suspect that was a large part of the TRV-35's appeal as well. A common problem with projectors, particularly older ones, I think, is uh, they often couldn't overpower room lighting. Uh, whenever we had slideshows when I was in school, they had to turn off all the lights, uh, which meant the teacher couldn't, you know, pause the presentation and draw notes on the whiteboard or something like that. Not that they could anyway, since the projector screen was permanently mounted in front of the whiteboard. And even with the windows shaded, the light filtering in still interfered with the picture. And this is pretty much my beef with projectors in general. I've never really liked them. Uh, modern ones do better with room lighting, but they still look vague and insipid to my eyes. On the other hand, a 32-inch color CRT is plenty visible under normal lighting. It has great saturation and contrast. It's big enough that a medium-sized class could see it easily, and you can put it wherever you want. So if I were teaching in like 1992 and I needed to show some slides, I would probably prefer one of these just plugged into a TV. Now, there had always been consumer products for converting slides to video, and they were usually much simpler. Uh, for instance, there were cheap little plastic gadgets with a lens and a screen. Uh, you'd point your slide projector into the lens, then point a video camera at the screen and just record the images focused onto it. Now, I've never used one of those, but I have to believe the quality was atrocious. Uh, the point, though, was that you already owned a camera and a projector. It was an inexpensive way to just marry the two together. 
and people generally had auto-loading carousel projectors, so you could just hit record on your camcorder and then step through your slides one at a time, hit stop, job's done, you put the thing away, you're done. Now, if you wanted higher quality and you were willing to load slides by hand, uh, you could get a direct view converter. Uh, consumer camcorders have always had extreme macro capability, and these would just mount a slide three inches in front of the lens uh, with a light bulb and a diffuser behind it. I either that or you were supposed to just go <laughs> hold it in front of a lamp or, or, or a window on a sunny day. Uh, then you just locked off your focus and bam, you've got a nice crisp image at the cost of some extra tedium to swap slides. So the Elmo here, this splits the difference. The door on the front looks like it's gonna reveal a lens, but if we pop it open, there's actually a light bulb in there, and behind that, there's a diffuser. Uh, and if we unbolt this side door here, there's the back side of the diffuser. The slide is held right there. And then behind that, we've got a camera and a lens mechanism. If I just uh, illuminate this from behind and stick a tool in here, you can see this is just a completely ordinary video camera. So essentially what we have here is one of those direct view slide converters, except instead of using a consumer camcorder, it's got a dedicated module that's built directly in to a normal slide projector mechanism. And this gives you the best of all possible worlds. And I'll expand more on, on what exactly that means, but um, the question is who the hell needed this? Well, I haven't really been able to find any marketing material for this thing, so I'm not sure who they exactly advertised it towards, but I'm certain no consumer would have bought this. Um, we'll get into this, but this thing was expensive, and it would have been an absurd luxury. I mean, none of the consumer products for doing this were particularly convenient or high quality, but they were like $30, right? So... <laughs> The trade-off of uh, either quality or, or tedium was more than worth it compared to buying a whole other camera and projector, basically, just to do this one task. Uh, but obviously, for a professional, it could be well worth it. Um, you get peak quality, maximum convenience, compactness, high portability, all important things. Since you don't need to have three separate pieces of equipment, you can fit this where any other projector would fit. And it's got the carrying handle on there, so we can simply pick this up and take it to wherever we need to present. So a whole school could share one or two of these things. And that probably is how it played out because yeah, I'm, I'm certain these were quite expensive. I'm not sure what the MSRP of this particular model was, but uh, the earlier TRV35G from 1988 was about two grand, uh, the equivalent of about $5,000 nowadays. And for what it's worth, uh, someone on Usenet in 1996 was still trying to sell one of these for $2,200. Trouble is, he describes it as an Elmo Trans video, which could actually be one of several products. So let's do the tour of this thing, and then we'll come back to that. To be honest, you've already seen 95% <laughs> of what it does. There are basically no other functions. Uh, and most of this thing is essentially just an ordinary slide projector. Of course, maybe you don't know how those work, so I guess I could tell you a little bit. I only barely know how they work, but the basics are straightforward. There were many variants of slide projectors, but this uh, carousel design was quite common. The thing on top is the carousel, that's removable, and these were popular because they let you load up to 80 slides at once. As far as I can tell, Kodak originated this design, and there were clones and variations, but uh, the Kodak ones were everywhere. This actually is uh, Kodak branded, and it's very common to find whole stacks of these in the bottoms of closets at estate sales in these bright orange Kodak boxes. They're uh, real simple to use. You just uh, load slides into each one of these slots. Uh, simple as that. Although I will fully admit, I have no idea which direction <laughs> this is supposed to face. Uh, these are labeled um, this side towards screen. Uh, but which one's the screen? Would it be that way? Because that's, that's how you'd normally do it, because the screen would be out there. But here they've put the camera inside. So do they have you flip it around? Or did they mirror the camera to compensate for that? I don't know. What I can tell you is that you do have to put them in upside down. Now, I don't know if that's normal practice on an actual projector, but my guess would be yes, because um, generally speaking, uh, with a simple lens arrangement, the image gets inverted when it's projected. So I'm, I'm guessing this is how you'd normally do it. All the same, you're probably going to see some backwards photos in this video, but I guess that was a common phenomenon back in the day as well. Uh, anyway, so once you've loaded all your slides, uh, you can fit this locking ring and that keeps them from falling out. See, they're uh, they're all locked into their respective slots. You know what? I just put two slides in the same slot, didn't I? Yes, I did. 
People must have done that once in a while. Anyway, um, that makes the carousel portable and interchangeable. If we uh, release it here, I'll explain all that in a moment. We can just take it off the machine. See, now the slides fall out. Uh, and then you can store this. And when you want to view this set of slides, you just bring it in, you drop it on the machine, and uh, you're ready to go. Uh, there's an arm under this particular slot here, which lowers each slide into the image path and uh, if we uh, just tilt up here, you could probably see this. Uh, when we hit the button, it lifts that slide up, advances to the next one, and lowers it into the beam path. And you can actually see that happening on the TV here because uh, the camera doesn't shut off in between slides. Uh, it just turns off the light in the front. So if you look closely, you can actually see the arm moving, which I think is really, really cool. So yeah, this is a completely effortless and totally automated. When you're done, you just uh, hit the release, spin the carousel around and, and pop it out. And um, yeah, you're ready to move on to a different slideshow. And, and I think the idea was that you'd, um, you know, go on vacation, you take a thousand photos, you'd pick out 80 good ones and load them into one of these. And then uh, when you wanted to show off that particular trip, you just unbox it, drop it on the projector and away you go. No need to load slides one by one. Very convenient and a neat mechanism too. See, uh, on the bottom of this carousel, we've got this uh, galvanized steel sheet, uh, and it's got one slot cut in it, but all the other uh, slots are blocked, so the slides don't uh, fall out. And the sheet is locked in place, can't rotate, but when you install it on the projector, it unlocks this latch here. That allows the sheet to rotate separately from the carousel. If we put that back in the home position, you can hear it snaps into position. So the carousel goes on top here, um, obviously <laughs> the other way up. Uh, and then this plastic wedge, this seats between these two pegs uh, when the thing is stationary. And then when you hit the advance button, you can see that that pulls back and then the pawl next to it slides in between the pegs to rotate it by one slot. And the purpose of this wedge here is to index the carousel. In other words, um, suppose that it rotates this much but it doesn't uh, quite land at a perfect interval. When that wedge comes forward, it does that, rotates it to ensure that one slot and only one slot is directly over the aperture here. And that pawl moves either forward one slot or back one slot, but otherwise everything else works the same. So because of the relationship between uh, the mask and the rest of the carousel, you can't just uh, put this on in any position you like. Uh, you've got to rotate it around until it drops in uh, so that we know that slot in the metal shield is lined up correctly. And then uh, once you start playback, as it were, you can't take the thing off. Uh, you've got to rotate it back to that position because otherwise when you removed it, um, a slide could potentially fall out the bottom. So for that reason, uh, in addition to the forward and reverse buttons, we also have this select button. When you hold that down, it holds the uh, slide lifter in the upwards position, which allows you to uh, rotate it freely because otherwise, you would have to wait for the cycle to repeat over and over and over. But you could actually see on the top of the slides here that as I rotate past, the lifter arm is actually popping each one up slightly in turn. Oh, and uh, if we try and carefully position this between slots, when we let go, whoops, I did it too perfectly and the pawl actually landed on top of the peg. So let's get it just a little bit closer. When we let go, there we go. You can see it snaps. It's a very clever and also extremely common approach to solving uh, exactly this kind of problem. So that's essentially uh, three quarters of the machine or more. Most of this is just uh, a completely ordinary slide projector. The only real difference is that they reversed the optics. Normally, you'd have a very bright light back here, which illuminates the slide, and then a lens here, which uh, projects it. So they've just swapped it around. The light's on the outside, and then the uh, lens here, instead of expanding the image, it shrinks it onto a camera sensor back there. As noted, the uh, camera outputs completely ordinary NTSC video, although they did also make a PAL version, uh, naturally, and that would actually be preferable if you could swing it, because PAL is higher resolution and it has better color, and it's not like the lower frame rate matters for still images, although I will say that 50 hertz CRTs are painfully flickery, so <laughs> I would have hated using one of those in school. Uh, but um, more intriguing than the camera itself are the variety of outputs and inputs that it has. Like I said, I was using the uh, composite output, but this also delivers S-video and plain RGB, both uh, with uh, separate composite sync and with sync on green. Now that firmly seats this gadget somewhere in the professional domain. 
um, particularly the, the sync on green feature, because as far as I know, that was primarily useful for uh, like late 80s and 90s computer monitors. I don't think it would have had much use anywhere else. So with these very uh, professional features, it's no surprise that it also has Genlock. Now that takes quite a while to explain in full, but basically if you have multiple video sources and you want to switch or blend between them on the fly cleanly, you have to get them to line up the beginnings of each of their video frames perfectly. And gen locking is how you do that. This feature is here though, at least partly because Elmo sold a dedicated video mixer along with this thing. See, let's um, plug this back in for a moment. Normally when you're doing a slideshow, every time you advance, the image goes blank for a moment because again, you don't want to see the slide going away and coming back. So it just uh, turns the light off or it has a shutter. Uh, this doesn't feel very pro, however. So the idea was you'd buy between two and four of these uh, slide converters and then connect them to a mixer and use a computer to synchronize everything. So um, you'd begin your presentation by fading in on machine one with a slide already loaded. Then you'd crossfade to machine two, advance the slide on machine one while the audience can't see it. Then you could fade back to it and, and so on. This would give you a completely seamless presentation with no black frames. So Elmo either had the notion that these machines would get used for, you know, highly polished live shows by big companies, or they were picturing people recording uh, very nice looking slideshows onto videotape. And both are very valid use cases. But uh, what I got to thinking about is uh, this particular model, as far as I can tell, is from sometime in the early to mid 90s when Ken Burns' star was burning bright, but digital video editing was not yet highly accessible. And I can absolutely see that setup being used for like low budget, high quality documentaries. M more on that as we go. But in furtherance of that dream, the TRV actually has a serial port for computer control. I don't have docs for this, but apparently it could control all functions. Uh, that obviously is going to include, you know, stepping the carousel forward and back, but you can also presumably control the camera because the zoom, the focus, and the aperture are all adjustable electronically. I can imagine several uses for this. Uh, for instance, if we're just looking at a slide and we wanted to uh, push in on the center of it, we can do that fairly smoothly. Uh, although I suspect much of why this feature is here actually has to do with portrait shots. Uh, something I never really realized about slides for the longest time, even though the film frame is rectangular, the slide is perfectly square. And that's for dealing with uh, portrait photos. Um, you can just rotate them to be right side up. Because the NTSC video frame is a bit rectangular itself, if you're looking at landscape style shots, you're gonna to wanna to zoom in to have them fill as much of the screen as possible. But uh, when you come across a portrait mode image, it's gonna crop off the top and bottom. So you're gonna to wanna to be able to zoom out to get the whole thing. So, you know, that's probably what it's there for, but you could do some low budget Ken Burns shit with it. We gotta appreciate that. Now the focus is also adjustable and that seems kind of uh, pointless at first because we can rack it all the way from one end to the other and nothing really seems to happen. But uh, that's because the uh, depth of field is deep enough here uh, that it's not necessary. If we zoom in, however, uh, this is not an ideal photo, one moment. This is pretty subtle, so I don't know if you'll be able to see it, especially given um, the capture chain I'm using. But when we're zoomed in all the way, the depth of field is shallow enough that it actually is out of focus and we can adjust that. There we go. That looks much sharper, at least on the screen here. Oh, and you know what? This is probably less prominent than I expected because our aperture uh, is actually closed down fairly far right now. Uh, this thing has no auto exposure circuitry. It just shoots at a fixed shutter speed and you're expected to do all exposure compensation manually using the uh, camera's iris because if you're looking at uh, a well-exposed photo of a sunny day like this, you gotta close it down pretty far because the film is, is nearly transparent. You're almost looking straight at the light source. But if it's a photo taken in the evening, then it's gonna be a lot dimmer. So you're gonna have to open up the iris some to compensate. And then if you're looking at a picture of the night sky, well, that film frame is almost completely opaque. So you might need to open it up quite a bit this is kind of unfortunate. The dynamic range of this camera just is not as good as it could be. And that means that some images can't really be exposed correctly at all. Uh, for instance, oh, these guys here, these are a mess. This is actually completely unfair because uh, this is a very strange format. Um, let me get you a better backdrop. 
These uh, Panaview slides, from what I've read, uh, were souvenirs that were made by, well, Panaview back in like the mid 60s and sold in, you know, souvenir shops. And the whole point of them, I believe, was uh, to be viewed in, in Panaview's uh, weird little desktop slide viewers that just had like a light bulb and a magnifying lens. And so um, the square aspect ratio, which I think is the product of uh, 127 format film, wasn't a problem for those. But I have the feeling that Elmo did not consider these things when they designed the TRV. You can zoom out as far as you want, you won't get the whole thing, uh, because the lens actually uh, cuts off the corner of the image, uh, vignettes it really badly. Now, um... <laughs> I'm sure this did not matter to them because, well, uh, I believe by the time this thing was made in you know the late 80s or 90s, uh, this film format was long, long dead. Uh, but also, they were probably focused primarily on, you know, stuff people might actually use in school, which was far more likely to be uh, something like this. This is another one of those slides that makes me wonder exactly where this came from. If you sent this to me and I just forgot that you did that, I'm very sorry. Let me know. I'll put your, your credit in the description if you want. But this appears to be actually a, a slide for a classroom. This seems to be some equations. I don't know anything about them, but um, it's either for a math or, or a science class of some kind. Uh, and, you know, naturally, this just comes on a typical 35 millimeter frame. So I'm sure that's the only thing Elmo cared about. And it's not even... Uh, <laughs> germane to the point that I'm making. What I actually wanted to show you is that um, there's no way to properly expose these pictures. This image looks terrible. You can't really see anything down here because it's all blown out, and you can't really see anything up here because it's all just disappeared into the shadows. Well, if we open up the iris, then we get detail up at the tree line, but it blows out the bottom even worse. And if we close the iris, then we start to get some detail down here, uh, but the background just disappears. Now, this is completely unreasonable of me because this slide is actually ruined. Uh, if you can believe it, this is supposed to be a color photo, but apparently a lot of color film from the 60s fades to red like this. And in fact, if we look very closely and open the aperture all the way up, there is just a hint of green in the tree line. So this slide is totally wrecked and it was completely unfair to use this to test the Elmo, but I picked it because it exaggerates a problem that I've seen with a lot of normal slides. Uh, for instance, with uh, this picture here, obviously the sky is completely blown out. Uh, but if we close down the iris here, okay, now the ground is well exposed, but in order to see the sky, we've got to go further and we start to lose the ground. If you were looking at this on a normal slide projector, um, I think these would be much more balanced. In fact, if we just take a look at the slide directly on my modern camera, uh, which has much better dynamic range, uh, you can see what I mean. The actual photo is very well exposed. It looks terrific. You can see all parts of it at once, at least as long as you're looking at it through a sensor that can handle that wide a range of tones. Um, the sky is, in fact, much brighter than the ground, and our eyes can handle that. And this camera sensor is much closer to a human eye than anything you could get back in 1998. Uh, it's strange to think about, but electronic imaging just... Um, was kind of in its infancy still, certainly as far as anything a consumer could buy. Uh, so this is just uh, par for the course, really. So um, this thing is not perfect, who's surprised? But the fact that you're given full control over all these properties, let alone remote control from a computer apparently, is pretty phenomenal. You know, you could um, automate zooms, obviously, and uh, you could automate fades. Actually, I guess it won't fade all the way to black, so I look a little silly now. And you could even do some uh, very limited focus racking effects, uh, all in camera. And uh, again, I, I think a wannabe Ken Burns might have loved this thing. But that's uh, pretty much it for the main controls. We just have a couple minor things left. Um, there's a, a detail adjustment here. That's a potentiometer that just controls like a sharpening filter. Uh, then there's some uh, sync adjustments for the Genlock input. Uh, we also have a couple of remote ports. Generally speaking, projectors came with a remote on a really long cable, uh, so you could pace around the front of the room and just hit the button to change slides, uh, or have someone at the back running the show. Uh, so that makes sense. Uh, oh, there's also a timer on here, and this uh, theoretically would let you... Oh, hey, it started working. Every time I've tested this before, <laughs> it didn't work. I had no idea why, but wow, that is really, really fast. I think that's faster than it's supposed to go. Sir? Sir? Okay, that's better. It's supposed to go down to uh, one and a half seconds and up to uh, 30. Boy, it's almost like um, old stuff is usually not in the best condition and, and kind of flaky. <laughs> Who knew? But the uh, last control on here is this guy. This is the uh, color corrector. And if we uh, turn this on, the joystick allows you to rebalance all three color channels. Now, obviously, out at the edges, you get some pretty extreme effects, and that's neat. 
Um, but I think generally the purpose of this thing would be for some limited uh, darkroom capabilities. For instance, if you were um, uh, recording slides on the videotape for a presentation to play back later, and you had a whole bunch of photos with an overall warm color cast, and then you got to this one and it was just a little bit cool for your taste, you could balance it more towards the warm and then, you know, hit unpause on your VCR and, and dub off a, a few seconds of that slide, then hit pause again and move on to the next image, and then you could balance that wherever you wanted it, and, uh, and so on. And with that, you've seen pretty much all this can do. It's a very simple device. It does one thing, does it pretty well, I'd say, and uh, with a lot of flexibility, and that's probably why Elmo made these for over a decade. Uh, the earliest model that I can find was just called the TRV-35, no bloody A, B, C, or D, uh, and it may have been sold as far back as 86, but uh, I'm more sure about 88. Then they had the uh, 35G, uh, the H, uh, the XG. They also had a whole series of uh, 16 millimeter film movie converters called the uh, TRV-16. I don't know anything about those. And maybe they made more models. I, I don't know. The trail kind of goes cold at that point. But it seems that the uh, TRV in the name is short for trans video. That's the name of this whole series for obvious reasons. And that first model, uh, with no letter, seemed to have been sold under that name alone. It appears that the uh, TRV-35 was about $1,700, while the uh, G, which is much uh, closer to this, as we'll discuss, cost a couple hundred dollars more. So it almost seems like the original one might have been targeted at, like, rich dads rather than necessarily professionals. Uh, you could tell that the uh, top and bottom of the chassis, those are identical, but the back panel is completely different. Uh, the zoom, focus, and iris controls are all manual, and we have no outputs other than plain composite over RCA, which is so frequently all the indication you need that something is consumer-oriented. There's also a couple audio jacks back here. Those are curious. I found the manual for the 35G, and that says you can connect a slide quarter 801 to sync speech or music to your presentation. Uh, but the 35G doesn't have audio jacks, so I'm pretty sure it was just talking about sending some kind of pulse to the tape player to tell it when to play and pause. I I've seen those before. This apparently is the uh, slide quarter, and uh, most likely it's just an ordinary cassette player with a solenoid to start and stop playback. Very common thing. But it doesn't require any sort of audio pass-through on the projector itself to work, and indeed the 35G doesn't have one, so I don't know what the audio ports on the 35 are for. Anyway, that's the only part that necessarily seems cheaper. Um, if we take a look at the 35G, the more expensive model, it seems like the only real changes are the addition of BNC connectors and a Genlock input. There's no RGB, there's no S-Video, and the camera controls are still manual. Although that's no surprise because it also lacks computer control, uh, probably because Elmo weren't yet selling video mixers. That would have been a pretty spicy product for 88. So the 35H is a massive leap in capabilities over those models, but it's also quite a bit newer. The oldest references to it I can find are a couple brochures that seem to be from about 1998. I mean, they've got website URLs, right? Uh, and that makes sense because by 98, um, RGB video processors and, and computer-controlled mixers were far more accessible even to prosumers, and the interfaces were much cheaper to add anyway, so it made more sense to just put it all on the pizza in case anybody wanted it. Now, speaking of the other video outputs, I'd love to compare their uh, relative quality, but frankly, I'm just not very good at that sort of thing. And um, I've tried putting these through all the capture gear I have on hand, and the picture always seems to look the same, at least over composite and S-video. Uh, so either this has very good composite, very bad S-video, or my capture chain sucks. And I'm, I'm thinking it's the last one. I think there's a de-interlacing step going on somewhere that I can't disable, and Frankly, I, I, I'm just not the person to go to for quality uh, comparisons anyway, so I'd probably just screw it up. And as for the RGB, uh, I can't even capture it. I haven't found anything that'll accept that signal except my OSSC, and the result has a lot of distortions and color haze, uh, obviously not representative. I don't know if this is just um, tired circuitry in the Elmo, bad cabling, um, the converter not being dialed in, but in any case, it's a bad test, so I'll just stick with what I'm better at and show you the insides. Every single time I turn this thing off, I forget to take the carousel off first. You know, I should mention there is actually a, a way around that. If you press this release in the middle, you can pull it off. Uh, the trouble is now this thing is desynced, so you've got to rotate it until it locks into place. If you don't do it the right way up, then your, your slides can all just fall out. And you know what? Ever since I realized how this worked, there's something I've been wanting to try. Okay, that's not nearly as satisfying as I'd hoped. Plus, there's just no point. If you really need to bulk unload one of these, well, <laughs> it's as easy as that. 
I'm sorry for being so mean to these slides. They were already beat up when I got them, all right? I love doing that. This machine is magnificently well built. Um, if you haven't noticed, none of this is plastic. This is all cast aluminum or magnesium. I'm not sure which, but it has a tremendous amount of heft. Fortunately, it's not hard to take apart at all. There's just uh, four screws. And because they're going into metal instead of plastic, they're not hard to take out. One of them was under a warranty void sticker and uh, it was not void for whatever that's worth. Oh, they are very long, naturally. I gotta remember when I open this thing up to look for a casting mark and see uh, whether it's aluminum, magnesium, etc. It could just be a huge hunk of zinc, I suppose. Oh, wait, right, we gotta flip it around. Otherwise, there's an easy mistake to make. All right, this guy pops right off. Everything is anchored to the other side. And the easy mistake is one I am um, apparently <laughs> <laughs> already made. If you just try and yank this off, these cables will snag on um, the spade connectors down here and you'll have a problem. Um, I unplugged these earlier and forgot to ever plug them back in. Yeah, go me. Also, um, they're both black, so I, I put a flag on this one so I could remember that it goes on the top pin. Uh, but I also knew that very likely this is an AC fan and I can't see the label from this side, but it's easy enough to find out. That's probably just 120 volts, right? But it could be stepped down to like uh, 24 or something. Yep, just straight 120 volts. Not surprising. So here's the guts of the whole operation. And uh, you can see this is really two very different devices. Uh, the back half here is entirely concerned with processing the output from the camera module and, and controlling it, of course. So it's a lot of um, tiny wires and microelectronics. But then as soon as you get to this side, it's all just big, chunky electromechanical parts with like six or seven brain cells spread across the whole section. Uh, because all this does is control the slide projector, a much, much older and simpler technology. Now, I don't really have too much to say about the camera circuitry. It's all far too dense for me to understand. And uh, the actual imager, it's back here, but it's absolutely buried and invisible. There's no way to see it. I did manage to pull out the entire camera module, and I thought it'd be cute to uh, just point it at myself and wave, uh, but it doesn't really work. The lens back focus is set such that this can only do macro shots. You can't focus out any further than a couple inches. And I found it was so complicated to disassemble the camera side of it that I'd never get it back together it would just be ruined and all we'd see in the end is a module that i promise looks exactly like this they all look the same so let's just leave all that alone um for what it's worth though the pamphlet does say that the sensor is a half inch ccd with an 8 and 11 by 508 resolution which is enough for a full res ntsc picture that's about all i can tell you but it's also just about all there is to know on the other hand this servo mechanism uh, that is worthy of mention and i have a few things to say about it Pretty much any camera with automatic controls is built like this. You've got control rings on the lens uh, for iris, zoom, and focus. Uh, so if we adjust this one, there's your iris. If we adjust this one, there's your zoom. And then this one here is gonna be your focus, not that we can <laughs> really tell. And then the automation comes from these little tiny motors, which are geared to each of those rings, hence the, uh, the gear teeth on here. So if we adjust the iris, you can see that guy rotating back there. If we adjust the focus and the zoom, it's pretty clear how this all works. Now you noticed when I adjusted these by hand, it, it does not look very smooth, right? <laughs> Whereas if we do that with the motor, it looks quite a bit nicer, right? Because you've got a little tiny motor that's driving it through a very heavy gear reduction. So we can imagine that those earlier models with the uh, manual controls probably looked <laughs> about this awful. But I'm not actually sure that that's why they added the motor controls. I, I think smooth manual operation was just a bonus. The actual intent was probably just to make the uh, uh, serial remote control feature possible. And while shooting most of this video, I wondered how capable that feature really was, whether it had a, a whole bunch of, of hidden functionality that uh, actually makes this thing much more impressive than it seems, because that does sometimes happen with this sort of thing. However, I've just learned uh, the answer to this, and uh, no, no. One of my patrons actually dug up the manual for the 35H, and it turns out the serial command sequence is pretty straightforward. So I messed around with it a bit, and some of it works just like you'd hope. Uh, we can advance frames, and reverse frames. 
and we can turn the light off and on manually. That's cute. But uh, other things are a bit more disappointing. Uh, for instance, um, if we go through a little uh, calibration sequence here, this is the machine zeroing itself, figuring out where uh, the notch is. It takes an incredibly long time, but now it knows where uh, frame zero is, so uh, we can now tell it to go directly to a predetermined frame. Uh, for instance, this will tell it to go to slide 20, which it has to do one notch at a time. I admit I was expecting it to just go clunk once and then shoot around to the slide I wanted. I, I can see why that didn't happen though, uh, because there's no encoding mechanism on here. This missile doesn't know where it is. It only knows where it isn't. Uh, there's a micro switch under the notch in the tray here that can sense slide zero, but that's the only information it has. So once it's found that, it can step one at a time to get to any slot, but it has no way to reliably skip multiple slots at a time which is incredibly ironic because this thing is essentially a perfect rotary encoder. Uh, these pegs, as we established earlier, each correspond to one slot. So they could have a, a follower that just rides on these as it rotates and, and each time it pulses, it knows it's gone uh, one position. Uh, so it could easily use that to rapidly index to any given slot uh, with the addition of just one micro switch or, or even, now that I think about it, a simple optical sensor. So, um, that feels like a really huge miss and a huge disappointment, but it gets worse. There are commands for adjusting the camera, the zoom, the aperture, and the focus, but the only parameter they take is in or out. You can't tell it uh, to go to a specific position for reasons we'll get into in a moment, and everything moves in fixed increments. So every time we send the zoom in command, it moves by that much, and you can't make it a bigger or a smaller jump. Now that's too coarse to like chain the commands together to get a nice ramped zoom in effect. So yeah, um, despite my jokes about doing the Ken Burns thing with this, you will not be producing a documentary on baseball using this machine. And that's such a shame because they were so close to making a machine that could do it. As it stands, I'm not really sure what most of these computer controls are good for. So with the computer integration being so limited, I think in practice you'd mostly have just operated this thing by hand. And that lets me segue into a neat feature of this and, and probably many other consumer video camera lenses. These motors here are generally referred to as servos, but while that word often implies a feedback mechanism, something that would let the computer know where each lens ring is positioned, this has none. That's why there's no serial commands to zoom or focus to a specific point, because the computer doesn't know where any of the controls are, or even where they aren't. It doesn't even have limit switches, and that means this system has no way to stop you from running these motors as long as you want, even if the lens has nowhere to go. Fortunately, they accounted for this. If we hit the focus button, when it hits the end of its travel, it stops spinning, but the motor keeps going because it has a little tiny clutch. This here is the clutch mechanism. Uh, this spring is under tension between this plastic end cap and this gear. The gear is actually uh, freely spinning on the shaft. The only thing that makes it spin with the motor is the tension of that spring. So when resistance is low, that pressure is enough to couple it to the shaft, but when resistance goes up, the spring begins to slip. And just like that, we have ourselves a torque limiting clutch. One thing I really like about this is the way they've coupled this end cap to the shaft. It's actually dogged. Uh, you can see this, um, uh, this white shaft here flares out horizontally, but there's actually a, a cruciform shape cut into this cap here. Uh, if you'll forgive my uh, dirty fingers, I'm going to see if I can uh, uncouple this for you. You just compress the spring, then rotate, and there you go. It comes right off, and I drop it into the mechanism. And then you can see that uh, this guy is just uh, freely spinning on the shaft there. The only thing that uh, makes it move is that friction. Hmm. Am I going to be able to get that uh, cap back out? Well, one hopes. There it is. Naturally, this is much more fun to take apart than it is to put back together. Ooh, I get to compress this spring. That's going to be great. But before I put it back together, I can just show you how this works. You can now see that uh, despite the cross-shaped cutout, there are ledges. Uh, little uh, little landings in each one of these wings. And that's why when you rotate this 90 degrees, uh, it engages and seats onto the dogs. It's a very simple way of doing things. I've seen this many, many, many times, but um, every time I do, I, I just love it. It's one of my favorite ways uh, to transfer force. And now 
I get to try and put it back on. Wish me luck. Oh, there we go. Oh, hey, I got it. Now, I should mention that um, while this machine definitely has some <laughs> overbuilt parts, these servos are not among them. Uh, when I got this, uh, two of these controls worked, but the iris didn't. Um, I could adjust the ring by hand, so I knew it wasn't jammed, but when I pressed the button, I didn't even feel the motor torquing. And I figured, you know, it could have burned out, but um, I was guessing that it was just bad lubrication. So I took everything apart and found that uh, once I removed the gearbox, the motor spun freely. So the problem must be with the gearbox. I took that apart and I found it was full of very tiny gears, all made of crappy looking plastic with just a hint of grease inside. And the consistency wasn't the worst I've ever seen. It hadn't yet turned into cement, but I think the combination of low torque from the motor, high friction from the cheap gears, uh, the very high ratio and slightly thickened grease all added up to stall out the motor. So I pulled the gears out, I rinsed them off in isopropyl. It's not the best solvent for this by far, but it was the only thing I had that I was sure wouldn't melt anything. Uh, then I put it back together with a dab of silicone grease. Again, the only thing I had that I trusted not to melt plastic. And lo and behold, the servo works again. I feel like this wouldn't have happened if they'd used brass gears, but what do I know? L literally nothing, I, I never went to school. Now, turning our attention to the other half of the machine, Sort of feels like stepping about 30 years back in time, which, which makes sense because really what we have here is just the innards of a carousel slide projector, <laughs> which is a much older device. The purpose of everything you see uh, in this whole half of the machine is just to rotate the carousel and lift the slides. And it too is a pretty clever system. The motor down here, this uh, great big shaded pole AC behemoth is what runs the whole mechanism. So if we hit the uh, button, that's what a cycle looks like. And you'll see, even after all of this has stopped moving, there's still a lot of momentum to bleed off. The rest of the mechanism here requires a lot of torque. So the motor uses a worm drive in order to get a steep gear reduction, but that gives the motor a lot of wind up and wind down time. And that doesn't fit the mechanism very well. Uh, each cycle has a very well-defined start and stop. Uh, so to fix this disparity, we have a very simple clutch mechanism down here. The motor drives a white gear, although I, I think cog might be more accurate because rather than meshing with another gear, it engages a metal catch on the other side of this clutch. So when you hit the advance button, a solenoid releases that catch. A spring flings it downwards, it hooks onto one of the teeth on the cog, that couples it to the motor, and it begins spinning. But the solenoid immediately drops, and when the catch comes around again, it's yanked away from the cog, instantly decoupling it from the motor. Now, I'm kind of surprised this system still works. Um, we have a steel tab being yanked away from a plastic tooth under heavy torque. That seems like it would very quickly wear away the teeth. They aren't all that deep either. There's not a lot of meat to lose before they, they wouldn't catch anymore. So yeah, I wonder, uh, maybe this machine wasn't very heavily used. Maybe this is just a very tough plastic. Maybe the grease is doing a lot of heavy lifting or maybe it's just that uh, due to the high tooth count, the wear is spread around so evenly that it can survive for a reasonably long time. I don't know. Um, but other than that, it seems like a pretty cool design. Uh, now, the reason we need so much torque is because it's moving a lot of mechanisms at once, and it doesn't have a lot of leverage. I would love to take this thing all to bits and show you every part of the mechanism, but I'm positive I couldn't get it back together, so you're just going to have to take my word for it. The uh, lifter here, the guy that uh, lifts and lowers the slides, that appears to be a class 3 lever. Um, the fulcrum is way down here, but the energy is being input right next to it. It's coming off of this uh, cam here. So there's a lot of mechanical disadvantage there, and it needs a lot of force to uh, get that lever moving. Uh, and that cam is driving uh, many other things as well. Uh, for instance, the slide clamp. This uh, metal plate here is hinged, and whenever we advance the slide, that lifts, and then when the new slide drops in, it uh, flips forward to clamp it against the steel plate there, uh, which ensures that the image plane doesn't shift in between slides. And of course, as you saw earlier, we've got the pawl that rotates the carousel and the one that locks it in place. It's hard to see all these in action since everything is so dense, but just in my estimation, it seems like the motor is fighting a lot of mechanical disadvantage. There's a lot of um, leverage here uh, working against the motor. And that's kind of a common thing in a, a you know, consumer automata like this, at least in my observation, and it still works just fine, so I can't really complain. And that's pretty much the Elmo in a nutshell. It works just fine. There's nothing particularly remarkable about it except that it exists and I didn't know anything like this was ever made. 
I mean, obviously nowadays there's billions of slide scanners on the market, but nothing quite like this. Uh, the high-end ones are conventional linear scanners, so you have to wait a long time for each frame, and then you just get a file you can view on a computer. Uh, they don't have live video outputs. Uh, and then you have the flood of consumer models, which I'd guess are all the exact same unit under the hood. They're pretty obviously built very much like this, using a camera module to capture a whole film frame at once. Uh, but if you look at sample scans, the uh, paint-like digital noise removal artifacts are a dead giveaway that these are basically the same cheap 12 megapixel Sony sensors you'd find in a smartphone. So they suck. But more importantly, I haven't found any evidence that they can do live video output, nor do any of them have automatic loaders beyond, uh, you know, five or six slides. This device is interesting because you can put 80 slides in it and cycle through them indefinitely, um, perhaps with a, a computer controlling the process or, or just automatically like this. And I feel like there are people out there who would love to use this in a video art project, that sort of thing. And it probably wouldn't be very involved to replace the camera module with a modern one that spits out HDMI. So if you come across one of these on eBay, maybe pick it up and give it the college try. But at any rate, that's all I have to say about it. Uh, there's no great revelations, just a neat thing I found that I wanted everyone to know about. Uh, so if you enjoyed this and you're new to my channel, consider subscribing if you haven't yet. Uh, remember to turn on notifications if you want to find out when I upload new stuff. Um, but if you really liked this and you want to make sure I can continue making stuff like it, uh, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these folks are doing. Uh, everything I do is funded by viewers like you, including buying weird stuff on eBay and hoping it turns out to be interesting. So I'm incredibly grateful for everyone who's supporting me on there. I can't thank you all enough and everyone else. Thanks for watching.